Hey guys, Mr. Klein here, and we are starting a new unit on topography and landforms. And so we're going to get into a really, really important part of uh, Earth Science, and that is weathering, Chapter 5, Lesson 1 in your textbook. Let's go ahead and let's get started with that. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to answer three questions. Number one, how does weathering break down or change rock? Number two, how do mechanical processes break down rock into smaller pieces? And three, how do chemical processes change rocks? Okay, so let's get going with this and uh, let's get started. Now, if you remember, uh, back in sixth grade, uh, you learned about uh, physical and chemical changes. You learned a lot about chemistry. And so we're going to be revisiting some of those concepts today. And you remember that all things have physical and chemical properties. Uh, physical properties are things like how it touch and how you, it, it works with the senses, what it looks like, things like that. Chemical properties are the actual chemical components of it. Uh, for example, the chemical composition, it's you know, the elements and molecules in and itself. And elements and objects can actually change through physical or chemical changes. Physical changes can be uh, either a change in its size or its shape, like you chop something up. You can chop up an apple. That would be a physical change in the smaller pieces. Or you can change its physical state, whether it's solid, liquid, gas, or even a plasma. So just like water goes through the three chemical changes as you warm it. It starts out as a cold solid and ice, melts into liquid water, evaporates into liquid uh, water vapor gas. Now, however, chemical Chemical changes are the changes that occur chemically to the actual chemical uh, chemical composition of the element. So, for example, uh, you pour gasoline into your car, uh, and you start the engine, and the fact of combustion ignites the gasoline. Energy is released, and in addition, water vapor and carbon dioxide are released. Okay, so the over time, the gasoline changes from gasoline molecules to water vapor and carbon dioxide. So that's physical and chemical changes, and. Obviously, as a result, things on Earth will go through physical and chemical changes, and this is what we call weathering. Okay, The physical and chemical processes that change objects on Earth's surface over time are called weathering. And over thousands of years, here we're going to talk about the first type, this is mechanical weathering. Okay, Mechanical meaning physics, uh, mechanical changes of the machine and action and things like that. Mechanical weathering breaks up rock into smaller pieces. So let's look at mechanical weathering. Now during mechanical weathering, physical processes will break up rock into smaller pieces. So you might start out as a big huge boulder, but you end up with dirt. Okay? That's essentially mechanical weathering from the very beginning to the very end. Okay? Uh comes out the mantle, you know, molten rock, it's an igneous rock, it cools off into solid rock, mechanical weathering takes over and before it's all said and done, it's sand. Okay? Now, mechanical weathering, this is important to know, mechanical weathering does not change the chemical makeup of the rock. So, for example, if I just use the example. Uh, so, we have some quartz minerals that are included in granite. Okay? And mechanical weathering gets, takes place and it ends up breaking down, no matter whether into sand. So, whether it's a piece of the granite or the sand, the quartz mineral is still quartz. No matter what happens to it in mechanical weathering, quartz is still quartz. It doesn't go through any chemical changes. The chemical formula remains the same. Now, when mechanical weathering breaks rock into smaller pieces, this is how mechanical weathering goes on and increases. Because what will happen is over time, the surface area of the rock increases. So think about it like this. So you have a pie, okay? And every time you cut the pie and take a slice out, the surface area increases. Why? Well, because before the pie was cut, you had the surface of the pie, the crust. And the crust just covered, you know, over the top and around the sides. Whenever you cut a slice out, okay, you take the slice out. Well, you still have the top of the crust. You have the bottom of the crust. But you also have the filling on the sides. Okay, the surface area increases. And when there's a larger surface area, that means the mechanical weathering processes have more area to work. Work. Okay, so they'll break that off smaller and smaller pieces until it's finally really, really fine and really, really small. And this can lead to some rather dramatic uh, processes. For example, this is on the Matterhorn in Switzerland, okay, a famous mountain. Mechanical weathering in action. Wind 
throwing particles, hitting it, has changed this solid rock into, has holes on it. Swiss cheese in Switzerland. Uh, pun kind of intended. But anyway, you see the process that the rock's slowly being stripped away and little pieces of it are being broken apart little by little. Okay, and the results of that is erosion, which we'll talk to some more. Now, uh, as a result, once rock gets broken all the way down, it becomes what we call, uh, is what we call soil. Now, there are mainly two types of soils that we'll get into, okay? And the first type of soil uh, is whether it has sand or clay, okay? And sand is generally has larger particles, clay has smaller particles. So clay soil holds more water and nutrients because it consists of smaller particles that have more surface area. As a result, they can be weathered even more, so it gets really, really fine and really, really small. And as a result, because it's really, really small, it fits together really well and compacts. And whenever you have compacted clay, it forms a barrier that water can't pass through. So whenever we talk about soil, and we look at the soil types, and I bring some soil types in west from western Louisiana, uh, we'll find that they have a much higher clay content, and actually if I compact the clay, you can pour water on top of it, and it'll sit on top of it, which will be a demonstration when we talk about clay and sandy soils. I'll show that, that guys, to you. Now, there's that's first mechanical weathering. There's one type, and uh, essentially it involves ice wedging. Essentially what happens is exactly what it says. Ice wedges itself into the rock. So what will happen is you have some liquid rock, I'm sorry, liquid uh, water gets poured onto a rock, it seeps into the pores, and it sits there. Water freezes. When water freezes, it expands. Its surface area expands. Okay? When it warms up, the water melts into liquid water and gets evaporated off. So what will happen over time is the rock will, the pieces of the rock will get expanded slowly and slowly and slowly because the ice, when it grows, gets like a wedge. If you've ever seen a wedge in action, remember that's a simple machine. You put a wedge in something, like I put a wedge underneath my door. It goes between the floor and the door and it keeps the door from moving. And what happens over time is there becomes so much wedging that the rock actually breaks apart. Okay, so this is ice wedging in a rock up in Sweden. So, what will happen is water expands, like I said, when it freezes, it makes the cracks larger, and sooner or later that wedging becomes so great it breaks apart. Now, uh, what will happen uh, with wind, like for example this mechanical weathering, is through the impact or friction of the air molecules or even the friction of sand or rock particles going through, that's what we call abrasion, okay, and abrasive, like for example, uh, you have a really uh, sticky stain on a pan, and you try to watch it, you get a Brillo pad or some steel wool, and you scrape on it, and you rub it real quick, really hard, and that steel wool is an abrasive, and so what it happens is through friction or impact, it takes the stain off of the pot, okay. So we have that, and then we also will have even plants and animals will contribute to uh, physical weathering because plants will grow in a crack, and much like ice wedging, it'll break it apart. And animals burrowing through loose rock or even dirt can cause mechanical weathering. So here's an example: plant weathering, not really real rock, but rather man-made concrete. Okay, what happened was this uh, sidewalk was uh, laid down next to a tree. The tree grows. Well, what happened? Well, the tree kept on pushing and pushing and moving, and eventually all of the sidewalk broke. Now, in Louisiana, we have to deal with animals uh, doing some we mechanical weathering itself through the form of nutra rats. And nutra rats pose a threat to natural and man made levees, uh, preventing coastal erosion, which we'll get to later. So, what happens essentially is nutra rats will dig into the ground, okay, and they like swimming around. So, they dig into the ground, into the levee, they build a nest. Well, this nest leaves a vacuum, uh, a vacuum in terms of a lack of water, okay? And so what will happen is water always rises to, uh, rises to an even level. So this hole in the, le in the levee or the, or the side of the ditch or something like that will cause more water to flow through. And because water rises up to this new level in there, it'll match the outside and the inside. And what ends up happening is the flowing water and abrasion will take place. And all this dirt right here will get moved off. And all over southeastern Louisiana, we have problems with nutra rats because they're not being, uh, they're growing far faster uh, than the industry using them for fur 
uh, can take them out. So as a result, we got nutrients all over the place eating through wetlands and eating through marshes and eating through levees and stuff and causing damage. So all these green spots are sites of nutrient damage. And so the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries has allowed hunters to kill nutrient rats uh, for profit. And so all of these yellow areas are areas where hunters hunt for nutrient, but all the areas in red are the ones that aren't. So all over southeastern Louisiana, we have a very serious problem with uh, nutrient rats and they're chewing through the grass and chewing through the soil is causing weathering, mechanical weathering. Now, so that's mechanical weathering. It's changing the chemical properties of the rock or the soil, not the chemical composition. Because no matter how much a nutrient rat chews through a levee, it's still soil. Okay, it's still a particular type of soil. But what happens whenever we change the chemical composition of a rock or a uh, mineral or soil? Well, that's chemical weathering. Now, during chemical weathering, the materials that make up rocks are changed into new materials. The most common chemical used in chemical weathering is water. Yes, water. Water is an important agent of chemical weathering because most substances will actually dissolve eventually in water. It will actually change its chemical composition. Okay, one big example of rock is actually limestone. So we have right here, we have two things of limestone. Okay, on the left, we have mechanically weathered limestone. On the right, we have chemically weathered limestone through water. Water over time flowed through this area on the right and flowed down. And what you see are the changes, okay, the actual strata and the actual layers are actually being laid down, but it was smoothed out because uh, limestone actually dissolved. And if we go back to our initial picture, limestone dissolves and creates calcium carbonate and things like that, which creates endorcades and stalactites and stalagmites. Okay, so this is a result of chemical change. Limestone was dissolved in water and created this. So, that's water's the first way we can uh, go through chemical changes. The second is an acid. Okay, think back to sixth grade. We've talked about physical and chemical changes. Now we need to talk about acids and bases. An acid is a much more powerful weathering agent than water. Why? Because the measure of acidity is pH. Remember the pH scale where water is a 7, anything below a 7 on the pH scale is an acid, anything above is a base? Well, acids provide extremely powerful dissolving agents. And acids have a pH of less than 7. Water, naturally, natural water, water falling from the sky, is slightly acidic. Uh, your average water has a pH of about 5, 5 to 6. Uh, very rarely will it be above 6 uh, just because of natural chemicals in the air. However, because of industrial pollution uh, pumping out uh, chemicals in the air, these chemicals bond with water and form what we call acid rain. And this acid rain has a pH less than 5. Okay, Acid rain usually has a 4.2 to 4.4. Okay, Clean rain is about a 5.6 on the pH scale. So that's a big difference. Okay. Uh, and orange juice, you know, orange juice and soft drinks have a pH of 3. So it's almost as acidic, it's getting almost as acidic as orange juice falling from the sky. And so what happens with powerful acids? Well, let's look at old George Washington. This is, this is actually from limestone, okay? Limestone statue of George Washington. And what you see it is the acidic rain at pH of a 4 has fallen from the sky and has eaten away and changed the chemical composition of this limestone. And it's eaten away in the face of old George. Now, in the United States, we find acid rain mainly in the eastern part of the United States because the industrial part of the United States is mainly in this area and in particular and in particular in the northeast, okay, the old industrial belt, okay, from Ohio, Pennsylvania into New York, and in particular Ohio and Pennsylvania. There was a lot of industry there pumping out a lot of things in the atmosphere and this caused a lot of acid rain. And government action and companies trying to clean up the environment have caused over time the acid rain to be reduced. However, it's still really, really bad. I mean, if you look at some of these worst spots in uh, Pennsylvania, you have acid at a, a rain at about a 4.2. Here in South Louisiana, we have about a 5.1. That's slightly acidic. Okay, remember 5.5, 5.6 is a bit more natural. And so you even get up here far away from 
up in North Dakota, far away from industrial processes and where the rain and stuff moves through like that, uh, you get a pH of 6. Okay, so, uh, so we have water, we have acids, and then we have oxygen. Oxygen is the other way that chemical changes can happen in rocks and soil. Okay, the process of oxygen combining with other elements is what we call oxidation. The most popular form of oxidation that we think of is actually rust, okay, where iron combines with uh, oxygen and it forms rust. Now, most oxygen used in the oxidation process comes from the air. And any product of an oxidation is an oxide, the combining of oxygen with something else. It's carbon dioxide, okay? Carbon dioxide is an oxide because it's oxygen combining with an, another element. Now, oxides are pretty useful because they tend to break down elements into ores, which people use to obtain metals. Oftentimes, you'll have the metal bonded with oxygen. And because this oxygen bond tends to make the bonds between the elements much weaker. And of course, most of the time, we'll use it for iron, OK, like that. And so this is where we use it for mining. But Earth isn't the only place where we find oxides in soil. In fact, on Mars, Mars's red hue is a result of oxygen combining with the soil to form rust. Okay, so this reddish color of the Martian soil is because of oxidation. So Earth isn't the only place where we see oxides in the soil, okay, on Mars also. Now, finally, the outer part of the rock uh, oxidizes because the most because like mechanical weathering, it has the most surface area in contact with oxygen. Uh, if you pull out a natural oxide from the ground or from soil, what you'll end up seeing is the outer part is pretty rusty. Once you crack it open, the iron itself is actually uh, nice and unaffected by the oxygen. But once you crack it open, then it gets uh, affected by the oxygen and begins oxidizing. Now. What affects rates of weathering? Well, one, in terms of chemical weathering, you've got to have a lot of oxygen, a lot of water, or we see in the eastern United States a lot of acid rain. But mechanical and chemical weathering depend on, the, like I just said, the amount of water for the rain and the amount of temperature. Mechanical weathering will occur fastest in areas that have lots of temperature changes, like the United States. Okay, Even up in Minnesota, it gets really warm in the summer, really cold in the winter. So ice wedging will take place because of that, because rapid changes in temperature for that. The ice freezes real quick, the ice melts, freeze, melt, freeze, melt, crack, the rock breaks. Okay, Chemical weathering is fastest when the climate is warm and wet because there's a lot of oxygen molecules moving around and there's a lot of water present to dissolve. Now, overall, weathering occurs fastest in regions near the equator, okay? Overall, now there are places up north, okay, where you see ice wedging and things like that. That happens there, but that's because it's further north because of those rapid temperature changes. But most oftentimes, you will see rocks weathered and soil weathered the most near the equator. In addition, uh, the type of rock also affects how fast weathering occurs. The most, in terms of a rock, which remembers a group of minerals, the most easily weathered mineral in a rock determines how quickly the rock weathers. And as a rule of thumb, the lower the mineral is on the Mohs scale, the more easily it will be weathered. Because remember, the Mohs scale is how easily a rock is scratched or its surface area is compromised. So naturally, wind blowing will naturally tear apart talc much quicker than it will quartz, okay? Because quartz is higher on the Mohs scale than cal uh, than talc, and also calcite will dissolve much more quickly because its number is lower and it reacts much easier with oxygen. So, really long lesson. I know that, but this is really important: mechanical and chemical weathering, especially when we talk about uh, erosion going with that. Now, how does weathering break down or change rock? Well, it does it in one or two ways. Weathering breaks down rocks by altering its physical state, mechanical weathering, or changing its chemical composition, which is chemical weathering. Okay, so there's two types: mechanical changing physical pro properties, chemical changing chemical properties. Now, what does mechanical? How do mechanical processes break down rock into smaller pieces? Well, mechanical processes break down rock rocks, break rocks down rather, by increasing the surface area exposed to weathering agents. Okay, this can be done through abrasion, that's when friction or impact getting hit by something breaks rocks down. 
ice wedging. That's when water freezes and contra uh, freezes and melts really quickly, and it slowly pulls the rock apart. Or exposure to the elements like water and wind. And in addition, plants can the roots growth of roots can break, much like ice wedging. And even animals, like in Louisiana, the nutrirat causes weather uh, mechanical weathering. Now. How do chemical processes change rocks? Well, chemical processes change rocks by altering their chemical composition. Water may dissolve minerals naturally, because water is a natural acid. In addition, most minerals will dissolve in water eventually. However, acid rain is a, mainly through an industrial byproduct, is a lower pH rain, uh, rainwater. And as a result, it will dissolve rocks and soil more quickly. Or minerals may go through oxidation when exposed to air naturally. Okay, and the outside of a mineral will be uh, oxidized, so you'll have a combination of oxygen and that element, whereas the inside stays unchanged. So that's your lesson. Really long, really important as always. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Uh, also, for my students, remember, uh, go through the book. Make sure you have all the information so we can talk about that in class. Thanks for watching.